Hello and a warm welcome to Signal or Noise. I'm Hans Lee of Livewire Markets. This episode of our economic show is dedicated to the most important part of the Australian economy, the consumer. OECD figures say that consumer spending makes up about 50% of Australian GDP and consumer stocks make up about 11% of the ASX 200. And during this interest rate cycle, the RBA has consistently called out the resilience of the Australian consumer, consumer confidence, and in particular, the fact that inflation expectations have not run away from them. But is the Australian consumer really as resilient as people say it is? And if it isn't, why hasn't it shown up in earnings until now? Joining me are three people who have fervent opinions on the matter, our panel. Delighted to have Ben Clark with us, Portfolio Manager at TMS Capital and a Livewire favourite. Also delighted to have Richard Shellback with us, Australia-based equity strategist at UBS. Welcome to you, Richard. And we have missed her for a while, but it is a treat to have Deanna Messina back, Deputy Chief Economist at AMP, back in her rightful place as the resident economist on this program. Hello, everybody. Welcome to you, Ben Richard, particularly first time. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, for our first topic, I thought we could delve into three charts that economists and strategists alike used to evaluate the state of the Australian economy. Here's the first one, it's retail sales. After peaking just after the, res the first Reserve Bank rate hike in mid-2022, it's safe to say that retail sales in Australia have well and truly fallen off a cliff. Year-over-year -year growth is now barely above zero. Second chart, the Westpac Melbourne Institute monthly read on consumer sentiment, and this is updated as of this month. Now, basically what this means is that economists survey about 1,200 people and they ask them not just how they're feeling about their personal finances, but inflation, mortgage rates, and other key parts of the Australian economy. And like retail sales, the aggregate consumer sentiment figure has been in the doldrums since the first rate hike. And finally, here's another important chart. It's the consumer savings rates. Or put another way, how much income do people have to spend after paying off their essential bills? During the pandemic, this figure reached a record high, as you can see in this chart, but this figure is also now near zero. So to kick things off panel, and Deanna, I will start with you, which of those three charts do you see investable signals in? I'd probably say the first one. I think that that really demonstrates the issue that we have in Australia, that retail sales and in volume terms has not grown in the past two years. But at the same time, that is sort of expected because that's the point of higher interest rates. Higher interest rates are meant to slow the most interest rate sensitive parts of the economy, which is the consumer. Okay, all right, and just confirming, I mean, you could also say that you find investable signals in consumer sentiment or the savings rate, but I take it the one you take from is mostly retail sales. Well, I think the sentiment figures uh, are a bit more nuanced because some consumers are feeling great. If you're a baby boomer age over 65, you're not feeling at, at those depressed levels like the average sentiment figures would tell you that, con that consumers are feeling. Sure, yeah, absolutely. All right, Ben, over to you. Which of these charts do you see investable signals in? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll go with number two to do something different, um, um, which you'd look at this chart and sort of say, why would you want to be in any sort of consumer facing businesses at the moment? Um, consumer sentiment has only got to these levels at the depths of the GFC and the depths of the COVID lockdowns. Um, but with my sort of glass half full mind, I kind of say that it's unlikely to get much worse from here and potentially I, I reckon it's much more likely consumer sentiment will improve over the next six to 12 months. And if I put my investing hat on, you got to remember like a lot of consumer facing stocks are priced with this current data in mind and maybe not a more rosy sort of view on where things could head from here. Because I really struggle to see them getting too much worse with the RBA levers that can be pulled. So I'm going to go number two. Yep, absolutely. Richard, what about you? Do you see any investable signals in any of those charts? Look, I'll go for the first one, and that is the deceleration we've seen in retail sales growth over the last few years. It shows us that the tailwinds that we had through the COVID and COVID exit periods are now well and truly exhausted. And we have faced up to the reality that there's a little bit of a hangover there. But where I think it's quite interesting is we can't think of the consumer space as a uniform group. The reality is there are companies and retailers who are still able to generate profits in this environment. So it's all about being selective. And that's very much what we're advising our investors in the same way that the consumer in Australia is bifurcated. 
so is the retailer space and therefore the strong operators are getting by but the weak operators are really struggling yeah absolutely and that's true across many sectors as well Deanna, this is probably a good time to bring up your chart speaking of bifurcated here's another data point that you have told us you are closely as an economist tell us what this data point is and why it matters to you so it's the global debt service ratio and basically it looks at what share of consumer incomes goes towards servicing your debt and in Australia nearly 20% of the average consumer will spend uh, sorry the average consumer will spend about 20% of their income servicing their debt. So uh, that's on an average consumer. Of course some consumers don't have debt. So we have to just look at this as an average household. But as in Australia we have one of the highest debt service ratios around the world. And to me, this demonstrates in particular the relative weakness that the Australian consumer has compared to other countries. For example, in the US, the US consumer has been exceptional. It's been the key driver of US GDP growth there in the past two years. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, thank you for bringing that along. For our second topic, we're going to talk about something that's been making headlines, the stage three tax cuts. Many economists agree that while it's popular, it's also inflationary and it could put a big thorn in the RBA side who are already having difficulty trying to get inflation back down to the 2 to 3% target range. But when the NAB asked over 2,000 people what they were planning to do with the extra cash, this is how they replied. As you can see, more than one third of the people who they surveyed said they would actually save the money and just 8% of them would spend it on wants rather than needs. And with that, Ben, I will turn that to you. Do you find that's a signal or noise? Um, it sounds like it should be a signal, but I'm going to say a noise. Go on. Um, you know, we've all made New Year's resolutions, and I think when you, these surveys sort of happen, I've always learned to be a bit wary of them because I think consumers have got a hope as to how they're going to behave, but the reality is habits can be ingrained and they don't necessarily behave they think they will. And I'd be... You know, I'm sure a lot of Australians have got the best of intentions to save these tax cuts or pay off their mortgages. But I think the reality is they'll probably spend most of it. Um, I don't think it'll be meaningful, but I think it will be a positive. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Richard, what about you? Signal or noise to you? Look, I 100% agree with Ben. Uh, we do consumer survey work of our own at UBS, and it gave a response that was quite counter to that. Uh, the 1,000 uh, survey participants that we talked to around Australia indicated they were going to spend it. And in our assumptions with respect to corporate profits and the way that the economy performs over the coming year, despite the challenges, we're making the assumption that all those tax cuts will be spent. Okay. Well, we've got a chart, I think, about that later. So hang around, folks, for that chart. Deanna, to you, what do you think? Signal or noise? I'm going to go something different and say it's a signal. And while I think that maybe consumers you know, will use it to, to spend on essential items. This survey was not the only one that said that consumers would save most of those tax cuts. Uh, the Melbourne Institute survey also had a similar response where about 75% of consumers said that they would save them. Uh, the issue for me though is how big is that tax cut worth? The average household got about $75 a month worth of a tax cut. To me, that's not really enough uh, of an amount to significantly change the picture for consumer spending. Once you take into account the fact that we still have high interest rates, yes, we, we may get some rate cuts, but they're probably not going to start until early next year, if not even a bit later than, than that. The tax burden for consumers is still quite high because of bracket creep and inflation is still elevated. So that to me signals, oh, and of course, not to mention the unemployment rate's going up. It's probably yeah. going to go up to four and a half percent, if not higher. So the pressures on consumer incomes are still massive and $75 a month isn't going to change the, the dial. No, not too much at all. Ben, this is a good time to bring back that bifurcation thing we were talking about and a good time to bring up the chart you've brought along. Tell us about the chart that you've brought and tell us what it says to you as an investor. Yeah, look, I, I saw this, so it just sort of stuck out to me because I think it does highlight a lot of the issues that the RBA has been facing and, um, and, and the resilience that we've been speaking about. Um, clearly, you can see in this chart that, um, yes, there is pain um, in some age cohorts in the economy, and that sort of looks like anyone from sort of 25 to mid-40s. Um, they're doing it tough, and they're either pulling back hard on spending or um, they're, they're, they've flatlined their spending and they're becoming very, um, you know, very sensitive as to where their marginal dollar goes. Um, but if you go further out than that, you can see that spending is alive and well. In fact, above 65, 
um, spending growth is growing above trend for those that, that demographic. And we know that that demographic is becoming a much bigger part of this population. So um, I guess if, again, look, looking back at investing, you want to think about who a company's core um, customer is. And um, I think you'll find that some companies are actually doing pretty well at the moment. Speaking as somebody in that 25 to 29 age bracket, I can totally concur with that spending chart. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that along. Our third segment is going to resemble something a little bit more of an open discussion. Now, our panel for today's show includes a strategist who is long discretionary. You might have been able to guess already who it is based on his comments. And a stock picker who has a major consumer staples company as one of his highest conviction and largest holdings. So we thought we'd ask each of the stock pickers, that's of course Richard and Ben, to give their view on where the consumer is going and how it's affected their choice of the stocks they are buying or selling. And then we'll come back to Deanna to get the economist view. So Richard, let me start with you. Would you give us your take, please? Would you rather be in consumer staples or discretionary stocks and why? Look, we're in consumer discretionary stocks, and that's been a sector that we've been overweight for two months now. Quite a non-consensus view, but one that thus far has played out. The stocks have performed strongly over recent weeks, and part of this is because the expectations on them were so downbeat. So it's not that we see the consumer out there accelerating, or that these companies being able to increase profits at a abnormal level, it's more that the expectations on them were unrealistically downbeat in our view. Now look, I'll point to this chart that I brought and it again comes from the consumer survey work we do. What was most interesting in the response we uh, published on about six to eight weeks ago was the movement up in some of those categories in the middle of the chart. I'm talking about international travel, food takeaway, domestic travel. These were places where previously the consumers were pulling back on their spending and that had been the case consistently for about the last six quarters in our survey. Whereas the most recent survey indicated, although slight, that they're now looking to accelerate their spending in those spaces, which is quite a turning point. And again, we link it back in part to those tax cuts. Yep, okay. so. When it comes to then the work that you do as a strategist, turning this macro into investable calls, where are you making those, those, those buy and sell calls then? And I, I know you were also talking about being selective earlier. So look, when you look at the listed retailers in Australia, they are generally the strongest operators in that space. It's the unlisted retailers and the mum and pop type stores that are more likely to be challenged. But the big listed names, or even the medium sized listed names, they've got the advantage of having far better brand power, a far better ability to push back on their suppliers and maintain costs, maintain their profit margins. Um, and if anything, what they've been able to do through this cycle is gain market share off the weaker names. So if I could just press you on that, you were talking about a, a big size retailer and even some of the medium sized retailers. What's maybe one larger retailer that you're backing and even one medium-sized retailer you're backing as well? Two retailers that we have been non-consensus and long and had buy ratings on over the last eight weeks have been Super Retail Group and Universal Stores. Yep, okay. So, so through the youth retailing space and the discretionary spend in terms of uh, sporting equipment and outdoor equipment, we again thought the expectations on them were unrealistically low and that therefore they made for a good investment at those share prices. Okay, super retail group and universal stores. That's interesting compared to what Ben was showing there about uh, youth spending and the different spending by age groups. Ben, I'll come to you. What's your take on all this? Would you rather be in the staples or the discretionary space and why? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go discretionary as well and, and maybe um, I, I would echo a lot of Rich's comments there selective. Um, I think our approach is not to go like top down, like to sort of say, oh, these are the areas we think might hold up okay and finding names in those areas. I think in particularly in retail, but in I think a lot of businesses in consumer facing are doing it tough at the moment, regardless of their size. And the management team is so important when you're investing. So it's like a bottom up sort of view that we would take. Um, and I think if you look back at similar tough economic climates like we're no doubt seeing at the moment and maybe some of those charts we we're talking to earlier. Um, it, for us, um, it's 
we, we saw strength in home improvement um, that surprised everyone during the last two big downturns in Australia. We saw strength in gaming, um, which continues to be an area that seems to um, surprise. Um, and then there's probably some more non-core things, but also looking potentially at more global consumer facing businesses. Um, so, you know, if I called out a few names, um, Wes Farmers uh, with the, the Bunnings franchise um, is a winner, I think, in this environment. But also the, this Anco business, which is coming out of Kmart, looks particularly exciting. And, you know, I think this is some consumers, regardless of which of those age demographics they're in, they want to feel like they're getting value for money in this environment and they get still getting reasonable quality. I think that plays into that well. Um, Aristocrat and Light and Wonder in the gaming space, um, they both have uh, quite a bit of North American exposure and I think the US consumer bounces back earlier and faster than the Australian. Um, and then a couple of sort of more offbeat ones, um, IDP is a business we've started to buy um, and Block is another one which are both consumer facing but going back to what Richard was saying earlier, they They've, they've been in a down cycle um, and the earnings and the share prices are priced as if that pain is going to continue for some time. And we think potentially it's not going to last as long as the market's expecting. That's really interesting. So I, I, I guess in, in your way, Richard, you were talking about being in those, in those quality retailers, but Ben, you're not just in those retailers, you're also in those consumer adjacent names, I, I take it as well, as you start talking about IDP and Block. That is fascinating. All right. Diana, obviously you're an economist, so you don't pick stocks, but I will still give the last word to you. How do you think an investor should be thinking about the state of the Australian consumer today? There is a bit of divergence always with the economics and then the investing landscape. I mean, just because the economy is, is strong or weak doesn't mean that it necessarily plays, out, plays into the investing universe, which I think is what the comments here really show, that they, there is this weakness in the Australian consumer, which I think will still continue probably for another six to 12 months, especially as the unemployment rate goes up. The consumer has been massively protected by accumulated savings, which have now been basically drawn down, especially for the younger uh, cohorts and also the strong labour market. Our unemployment rate is 1% below where it was before the pandemic, whereas in the US, the unemployment rate is back to its pre-COVID levels. So despite this weakness in the consumer, though, there are, are obviously opportunities in the investing landscape. So I guess you have to look at those specific names and also think about um, consumers still have to spend a certain amount of money. We still have massive levels of immigration coming into Australia. That will help to prop up dominant retail sales growth. So think about, you know, I mean, we can see this in the data that, that consumers are still spending in volume terms when there are big discounts going on. They're bringing forward their, their Christmas spending into November when the Black Friday sales are on. So that just shows you that there is still this, obviously this underlying demand for some discretionary retailing. It, it's just, it's quite specific and tailored. And on that note, that's Signal or Noise, the Consumer Show. A big thank you to a terrific panel, to Ben Clark of TMS Capital, to Richard Shellback of UBS. Thank you both. And of course, as always, to Diana Messina of AMP. Thank you very much. If you've enjoyed the program, please do subscribe to the Livewire website and our YouTube channel, as well as our podcast. And we'll see you next time for the Global Multi-Asset Show for 2024 of Signal or Noise. Thank you for joining us today.